This is Tito Santana, and you are watching the F and Sunny Show. Arriba! It was 1980-something, and 80s wrestling was as big as rock and roll. Wrestlers became Saturday morning cartoons, and their shows sold out arenas. While there were few minority That's mainstream Tito wrestlers, Tito Santana represented the values, language, and fight of the Hispanic community. Born in Mission, Texas, a son of migrant farm workers, Tito was a high school football star who got a football scholarship. He briefly played in the NFL and went on to become a Wrestling Hall of Famer. You would think after a successful career in wrestling, Tito would settle down. Nope. Just like the heroism of his wrestling characters, Tito served the greater good by becoming a school teacher, teaching high school students for the past 24 years. Tito Santana, not just a legendary wrestler, but a trailblazer and local legend. Hello, listeners. We have a very special guest with us today, Marco. Yes, we do. We have Mission Texas's very own Merced Solis, a.k.a. Tito, Tito Santana, Santana, a.k.a a school teacher who is teaching during this pandemic. So, uh, Mr. Solis, what's harder right now? Wrestling The Undertaker or trying to teach students during this pandemic? Trying to teach students during this pandemic, you know, it's a, uh, it I teach in the middle school. It, it affected all the kids. I mean, and who knows what kind of effects and the parents that have to stay, you know, I, I, we're doing both virtual and uh, in person. And uh, the kids that are doing virtual, I mean, it's hard to get them to come on board, you know? It, 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 I mean, we spend time calling and sending emails and, you know, and they're driving their parents crazy. And, you know, it, it's tough, you know, uh, people are going through some tough times. Hey, Mr. Solis, is it okay if I refer to, to you as Tito? You can call me whatever you want. Most people call me Tito. <laughs> the people from, from my, that know me, my relatives, my hometown, they, my, my nickname is Nune. They call me Nune. Uh, you know, nobody ever calls me Merced or Mr. Solis. You know, you know my friends uh, call me Sed. And, you know, I have all kinds of names. But you can call me Tito because that's how, how you guys know me, right? Tito, I just, after this is like, a, like we said before, this is Tito Santana, two-time Intercontinental Champion, two-time Tag Team Champion, and of course, WWE 2004 Hall of Fame. I'm leaving probably a couple things out, but that's what we're talking to right now. This is Tito Santana, the man. And Tito, you, you, just to confirm, you were born and raised in Mission, Texas, right? Yes, I was. You played football here. In Mission, Texas, too, right? Yes, I did. I, I played football and I, I played basketball and I did track. Can you tell us how was it like growing up in Mission, Texas? Well, the population was about 14,000. I came from, a, we were migrant workers. So my dad, I started going up north uh, to work on the fields as a migrant uh, when I was seven years old. So my dad would pull us out of school like in the middle of April and we wouldn't come back till about the middle towards the end of October. Uh, but I mean, I loved mission, you know, it, it was home, a lot of relatives. Uh, my mom had, uh, it was 16 in her family and my dad, there was like 12 in his family. So a lot of relatives in, in, in town and uh, you know, we didn't have much. Uh, we learned how to work. You know, we it was hard work, but we, you know, they taught me how to work and they taught me the, the value of uh, of the dollar. Was playing football here in Mission, Texas, did you get any type of scholarships to play anywhere? Yeah, uh, as, you know, my when I was in eighth grade, my uh, coach Sanchez was my gym teacher in eighth grade. And we came back uh, from Indiana, uh, like in the middle of October, about the 20th of October, something like that. And he started talking to me about uh, getting uh, playing football. And I had never played football. And I, you know, I, I was kind of afraid to, you know, to even ask my mom because 
I, I was under the impression that the players had to buy their own equipment. So <laughs> I, I said, uh, yeah, okay, I'll ask my mom to see if she'll see if she she see if she'll let me uh, go out. But I didn't, didn't even ask my mom. I came back the next day and I said uh, she didn't let me. The following year, my brother was two years older than me. He was going to be a junior. I was going to be a freshman. We left Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, and that was the first time that I started school uh, full time in, in, at the end of August. And uh, my brother was going to play football because he was a pretty good sized guy. And I just tagged along with him and I was hoping because I was kind of quiet. Uh, I was hoping that uh, somebody would ask me if I wanted to play and, you know, I mean, the good Lord put Coach Sanchez in front of me. He was walking with a freshman coach, and he, and he introduced me to the freshman coach, and he said, uh, if you can get this guy to play football, uh, he said, uh, he's, he, he'll be a good one. And so the coach asked me, do you want to play, son? He was a big lineman uh, coach. And I said, yeah. He says, we'll show up here at 7 o'clock in the morning. And that's, that's what I did. Uh, mission was ranked, uh, uh, I think, second in the state my sophomore year. Uh, I was the only sophomore that made the varsity that year, which was, you know, pretty good accomplishment for me, I guess. Uh, and I, uh, we had a great season my, my sophomore year, but then our head coach left, Coach Wright, and uh, the next two seasons, I think we won a, co a combination of uh, four games in two years. So there, there wasn't very many scouts uh, coming to our games, but I got two scholarship offers. One was uh, to San Marcos, uh, and the other one was to West Texas State. So I, uh, I went to West Texas State and, and had a very good season, you know, and, and a very good career at West Texas State. What position did you play? When I was in high school, I was a running back, and I, I played strong safety. My senior year, I weighed like 185 pounds. Uh, when I went my freshman year, I really, right before my freshman year, I started pumping iron. And uh, when I reported, I think I weighed like 205 and, and I was a tight end. Uh, tight end and linebacker, but, you know, I was, I, uh, as a matter of fact, I started four string tight end at West Texas State and uh, before uh, two days were over, because we had two days there also, uh, I was the starting tight end. And again, I I, uh, I was the only sophomore that was starting. I started uh, as a tight end uh, three years at West Texas State. I got a full scholarship. Yeah, that was the only way that I was going to be able to afford to, to go to go to school, go to college. And, and and I knew that education was was the way for me to get out of a being a migrant worker, because I, I had some relatives that were educated and they had a better life than I did, than we did. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I wanted to get, I wanted to go to college. You know, I was way behind because, you know, not that I was dumb, but, you know, I missed so much school at the beginning and at the end, I, you know, I was always catching up. You know, I loved school. The, uh, the reason I loved school so much was because the only time that I was in, working on the fields was when I when I was uh, going to school. When you were at uh, West Texas, uh, you did play with uh, Tully Blanchard and Ted DiBiase. Were you guys all on the same team? We were all on the same team, yeah. It was an honor, you know, looking back to, to have played with those two guys. What did uh, Ted DiBiase and uh, Tully Blanchard, what were their positions? Were they defense, offense? No, uh, Tully Blanchard was a quarterback. He was, quarterback? Uh, he was a pretty decent quarterback. Uh, uh, the Million Dollar Man uh, was playing defense his freshman year, and then they moved him. Uh, I think it was offensive tackle. From there, uh, was there, you know, even guys when you guys were playing football, was there talk about uh, wrestling? I know it was, you know, Tully Blanchard's father was, was already kind of yeah. like a promoter. Did you guys talk about that when you guys were Like, I didn't hang around with Tully or, or, or Ted. I was in a different fraternity. So I didn't run with those guys, uh, but my junior year, Tully just came up to me and says, uh, my dad thinks you can have a, a great career uh, as a professional wrestler, but 
my junior year, I started getting letters from uh, several teams in the NFL. I told Tully, I said, I wasn't a wrestling fan. I never watched wrestling when I was growing up. I, you know, it came on late in mission. Uh, so I said, uh, you know, I want to play football. And uh, I ended up signing with, uh, as a free agent with the Kansas City Chiefs. And then I was there for 10 weeks. Then I got cut. Then I went to Canada and played uh, Canada the rest of the year. And then I played the following year. And uh, I, I told Tully after my first year, I realized how tough football was. I said, I'd like to give, uh, I want to play one more year and I'd like to give wrestling a, a shot. And that's what happened. I went to Canada, played another year, came back. Tully graduated because he was a little bit behind me. Uh, he graduated and uh, uh, we both moved to Florida January the 1st. Uh, and that's when I started, 1977. Tito, when we bring up your name down here in South Texas. Most people say Tito Santana, the wrestler, but that would kind of be a, a incorrect because you're more like Tito Santana, the trailblazer. Uh, <laughs> because when we were growing up, right, Marco, we would watch like TV and we were in oh, yeah. to wrestling. And in the eighties, wrestling was very white. You had Hulk Hogan, blonde hair, blue eyes, there was no one we could really relate to until we saw you on TV. And you were kind of like our hero because you were the only person that we could relate to um, representing Hispanics, the Latino community up there when there really wasn't a, a, a big Hispanic or Latino presence on TV whatsoever. And, yeah. And I remember there was a show where the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, was, um, I believe the, the show revolved around him uh, burning down your house or kidnapping your parents, something like that. But he was in front of your house there in, with, in Mission, Texas. Yeah, he was with a Sensational Sherry, I believe, or Scary Sherry, all, you know, some of the other names that she was given, but... I think you guys were feuding at that time. Well, uh, ironically, when I became the Matador, when I was going to come out as the Matador, I was supposed to have a big feud with the Million Dollar Man. And they started doing those vignettes and, you know, for, uh, setting up the feud and really insulting me. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they dropped it, you know, and, uh, you know, so that's when I started thinking about just finishing up. You know, uh, I didn't think that Vince McMahon, I, I thought I had a lot of talent and I thought I was over with, I was I was over with the, the Hispanics. I was over with the blacks. I was over with the whites. I was over in, in professional wrestling. And I just, I, I would tell Vince, I don't think you're using me to the best of my ability. You know, I, I got so much to offer because I had already proved that I was a, 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 I could draw money for him, and I just couldn't figure out why, you know, you know, he didn't use me better. You know, I just got to the point where I just didn't want to be on the road anymore. You know, if I wasn't going to be used, you know, I spent 17 years in the business, in the WWF back then. We used to wrestle 350 days a year, so the sacrifice was, you know, way too much for, for the benefit that I was getting towards the end. And, and were there a lot of Hispanic wrestlers when you were wrestling within the circuits? Well, I don't know if you, when I started in 1977, I don't know if you ever heard of Jose Lutario. He was, he was a, a, a big wrestler in Texas. And then Chavo Guerrero uh, was from California, from LA. Uh, he was around already, and uh, uh, I don't know if you remember Pedro Morales. Pedro Morales was the, the WWF uh, uh, heavyweight champion at one point. Okay. So there had been, Pedro was from Puerto Rico, there, there had been uh, some other Hispanics, Mil Mascaras, of course. I, you know, I, was, I, I had the honor of teaming up with Mil Mascaras a few times, uh, but when the expansion and, 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 and the 
WWF became the WWE and started getting so big, uh, I, I think I was the I was the main uh, Hispanic that any Hispanic could relate to. Right, you were the first, uh, you know, Hispanic also with uh, the Intercontinental Champion. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Also, uh, also, I know we went back to you know uh, El Matador, but before that, uh, besides being the Intercontinental Champion, of course, you were with Rick Martel and Strike Force. And you guys, you know, won uh, the uh, the champ, you know, the championships. I think twice, but those were good, those were good years. I mean, those were well, those, you guys were like high flyers. And, yeah, I mean, we uh, we got over like a million dollars, and you know, from what I hear, his wife had a pretty. He he was from Quebec, Canada, so his wife had a pretty uh, severe illness, and he had to take. He told me he had to take some time off. Because uh, he had to be with his wife, and you know, I can understand that. Okay. And back in the eighties, um, Tito, wrestling—it was like rock and roll of wrestling. Wrestlers were like like rock stars, right? We were we were we were recognized as much as any other athlete in the world. I mean, we because we were they could see our faces on TV all the time. And, we were traveling all over the world, not only here. We were, in, in, you know, in the Middle East and Japan and uh, wrestled in Korea, all of uh, Europe. And, you know, no matter where we went, you know, we were recognized. And, you know, you know, it was it was it was fun times. And there was another individual from Mission, Texas, a famous um, actor that, that that died way way too soon um trinidad silva were you friends with him god he, he lived uh like five feet away you know my my grandmother had a little barrio you know they, they the the whole block and they had little houses no running water in the houses but uh all the, all our relatives lived in like we used to call it the compound and, and uh Tintin, we used to call him Tintin. He lived right next to me. Uh, he didn't have a father. He had a, you know, a three brothers and a sister. And uh, you know, the poor guy had. They were worse off than me. He was a little bitty guy. He was a year behind me in school. And come to find out, I think he was two or three years older than me when you know when uh, when he passed away. Uh, but every time I used to wrestle in L.A. Him and uh, there's another guy, uh, David Silva. Uh, we call him Borolas. Uh, he's still an actor in, in, in L.A. and I think he owns his own company. And but Trinidad was about to uh, get his own show. You know, he 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 was going to make it big. Uh, and we used to get together when I wrestled in L.A. and you know have beers. The, the, their wives would come over with them, and we'd sit in the hotel and we have beers and talk about old times. And I mean, I was. I was really proud of him, you know, because he made it. And uh, he was just, from what I understand, he was filming the series that he was going to be in. And uh, he came home on a Sunday and uh, a drunk, uh, like around noon, uh, ran head on and, and killed him in a car accident. You know, when you wrestled on the, on the single side, uh, compared to uh, doubles, you know, tag team, uh, was there any one particular person that was just you, you love to work with them day in, day you know day in day out? It was just a great tech you know great technician. You know you guys worked together really well. Any particular one you know well, during your time? Uh, me and Valentine had the longest feud in the history of the WWF. I mean we 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 drew some big crowds. You know we were the first uh, main event to sell out big big like the Madison Square all the big events big shows. Right without Hogan being in the card. I mean, right. we, we, we wrestled against each other for about a year and a half. But he was a different style of wrestler than I was. He was a brute, you know. Right. He was a fighter. Uh, a guy that was technical like myself that I used to love. If, uh, if people ask me if I had a, a choice to wrestle anybody, it, it's Mr. Wonderful. Oh, Paul and, Okay. Yeah. I mean, he was, you know, him and I used to have some unbelievable matches. Uh, he, he, he would just, 
he was a bad guy. He was a heel, uh, and, and he would just get heat by the stuff that he would do in the ring. Right. Uh, and we had, on, on several occasions, fans jump in the ring because uh, I used to sell pretty good. I don't know if you know the, the, the meaning of selling. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. When the baby face was done, mm -hmm. I, I was a pretty oh, good seller. And there were several occasions where, where you didn't see that often when there was so much heat that a fan would jump in, in, in the ring to help me, you know. And <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, Of course, Mr. Wonderful would beat him up, in a, in, you know. Oh, yeah. Pretty I've seen one of those poor fans trying to jump in there, and it doesn't work out too well for him, unfortunately. No. Uh, and, and going back, like I said, uh, Paul Underwood was a heel. You know, during your whole career, you never, you always stayed babyface. You never turned to heel, right? Yeah, I, I don't know if you remember when me and Rick Martel split up. Mm -hmm. I I, uh, I knew he was coming back, and I knew that they, they were going to do the split. So I asked Vince, I said, Vince, can, can, can I be the heel? Because, you know, I had seen a lot of baby faces who had done the transformation from a baby face to a heel and mm -hmm. got a pretty good run. So I was just looking to get a run. And I, I just figured right. I had the psychology of, of, of uh, wrestling and, and I thought I was a pretty good worker. I, I figured that I could make a, a pretty good, uh, a pretty good heel. Uh, but he said, no, no, you're going to stay. He says, I'm not done with you. Uh, there's so much to do with you as a baby face. You're going to stay as a baby face. Well, he BS me because he never did anything. You know, he promised me a bunch of stuff and never came through. Tito, you currently live in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, that is a long ways away from South Texas. Of all the places you could live, Hawaii, Miami, Barbados, you why did you pick New Jersey? The girl that I married is from New Jersey. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I, I owe Efren five dollars. That's <laughs> what he said. Efren said, "I bet it was because of a woman." I said, yeah. well, "Maybe we'll we'll bet on it." So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It always happens. It's a good reason, though. It's a good reason. It's a great reason. <laughs> it's you a know great how reason. that goes. I mean, I, you guys have no idea how much I miss the valley. You know how much I miss. You know, I go back and it's so different, but I still miss it. You know, when, when I was in mission, population was 14,000. Uh, from what I understand, it's, you know, when uh, in the winter, there's like over 200,000 people. In you know, it just has grown. The whole valley has grown so much, you know. Do you find it um, doing weird stuff because of the way you grew, you grew up, like in the valley? where in a big city or in other states, it's just not very like valley-ish to like hold open a door for a stranger or or talk to someone that that you don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I guess that's coming from a small town, right? I mean, uh, people from the valley are more friendly, you know. Uh, you do, I grew up, you know, we were a poor family, but we, we, we grew up and, we had to respect our, our elders, you know, uh, my, more so my, my mom and my dad, man, if uh, I do something, you know, if she was around, man, she'd, she'd smack you, you know, uh, she didn't care where she hit you, you know, and, you know so we, 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 uh, we respected, you know, people, you know, and, and that, that, that's, uh, I, I treat people the, the way, and the rest of the boys, I've always treated the guys the way I wanted to be treated. And a lot of guys had a lot of problems, but, you know, I never had any problems with, the, you know, any of the boys, you know, they, they respected me the way I respected them, you know, and, you know, I think it's the way I was brought up. And we, we have to ask you this question, Tito, is the Mexican food better in New Jersey? Oh. <laughs> no, it doesn't even come close. I mean, it, it's, uh, we knew the answer on that one, but we had to ask. We knew the answer. But I mean, how many times? Ask. How many times you hear here real Mexican food, and you go and you know it's it's Taco Bell or yeah. you know it's, it's it, no, it's, it's not like I mean, you know, people in the valley they they know how to barbecue uh, beef and you know chicken, you know, like nowhere else. Everybody has their their grills with, with like mufflers, you know, coming up, you know, from the <laughs> Come on. You don't see that up here. <laughs> you know, speaking of speaking of uh, you know eating down here, I had a buddy that wanted me to ask. Uh, I don't know if Efren will keep it in the in the in the final cut, but he said if you talk to Tito Santana, 
he's from Mission, and my friend's from Mission also. And he said, ask him if he's ever eaten at Diaz Diner there in Mission. I don't know if you've ever eaten there. It's a good yeah. place. Got great tacos. He just he wanted me to ask if he's ever, if you've ever eaten at Diaz Diner. No, oh. I've never, I've never eaten there at Diaz Diner. Uh, I have a cousin that that has a uh, right on right on uh, what is it, uh, four ninety five? It goes right through the middle of Mission. Mm-hmm. Yep. They have a Mexican restaurant. Uh, if you're going towards McCook, uh, towards the Seven Mile Line on the left hand side. Uh, it's a Mexican restaurant there, and, and I can't even tell you the name, you know, of, of the place. But uh, whenever I go there, I, I always go eat there. And Tito, what made you? You had a, a really good wrestling career, and you could have basically done like anything you wanted to, but you decided to pursue um, teaching. What made you? want to pursue of teaching after everything you've done well i was i was lucky i told you guys i liked school i studied hard i graduated in four years when i was playing football i i got my teaching degree uh i had a double major physical education with a spanish uh uh double major uh and it was my eighth grade coach that made a difference in me because I, I mean i could have gone and i was hanging out with the chucos you know when i was little it, I could have gone the wrong way, and, and uh, I, I feel like I, I owe it all to to that coach, you know, Coach San- Sanchez, who, who got me started into sports. And I felt that I know what I felt when 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 I, I saw how much he cared for me and he wanted to do something right by me. I said, I'm going to get into teaching, and uh, this this is before any of this wrestling and stuff. I, I said, I just want to be able to help somebody the way. He helped me. Uh, so when I retired from wrestling, uh, for a couple of years, I really didn't do much. You know, I, I learned how to play golf. I was playing golf three or four days a, year, a, a week. Uh, and my wife kept saying, why don't you go into teaching? You have your degree. And I just didn't think that, te- you know, well, teachers didn't make very much money. You know, I, I just didn't think it was worth it. And finally, I started subbing, and I subbed for a couple of years. Uh, and then finally, I, you know, I said, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into it." And now I've been teaching. This is my 24th year. I get a lot of uh, a lot of students asking for autographs, and uh, <laughs> do you get do you get a lot of students asking for autographs and stuff like that during class? Yeah, you know, uh, I live in a small town. So everybody knows I'm the, I'm the only celebrity in, in, in uh, Roxbury. Mm-hmm. So I'm a celebrity in town. Everybody knows me. Uh, so the kids all want to be in my class. And they, from time to time, we have downtime and we talk wrestling. And, and uh, they all tell, you know, my mom was in love with you. My grandmother was in love with you, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, you know, but I... I uh, the, at the beginning, they were asking me for a lot of gra- a lot of autographs, and uh, the 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 principal says, you know, you, you can't, you know, we're going to have to cut that out. <laughs> so, it was it was it was good that he did it. So we open our salon, and I tell the kids at the beginning of the year, every year I tell the kids, look, I work in my hair salon every Tuesday uh, from three o'clock until seven o'clock. I'm there. I, I, I work the desk. I manage the, the, the desk. I, I said, if you want an autograph, you want to take a picture with me, you have a relative that, uh, that's a big fan, uh, that's the time to come. I said, I'll give you an 8x10. I'll sign it for you. You don't have to get a haircut in my salon, but that's where, I'm gonna, that's where you're going to get it. You're not going to get an yeah. autograph here. So it works. That's good. And... I- you must have like one of the like best well-behaved classes in terms of like students behaving because you could put them like in a like cobra clutch. <laughs> I, yeah, but you know, you guys know, you know, kids, kids are kids. Uh, but I, I, I think I do intimidate you know the kids a little bit with my size. But I'm, I'm not the type of guy that raises his voice. You know, in the classroom, I, I, I'm pretty low-key, but, you know, I address 
bad behavior right away. You know, you know, I, I don't disrespect you. Why are you disrespecting me? You know, I want you to let me teach. And, you know, it works, you know. Uh, and sometimes you have the kids that nothing works and you just make a phone call. And sometimes you get, if you have a good parent at home, they come back changed. Uh, so phone calls are very important. And then sometimes you have kids who don't have anything at home that are just looking for trouble because well, that's what they're used to. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're looking for a fight, to, you know, for you to engage them in a fight. And uh, I, 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 I try to avoid engaging in, into arguments with any of the kids. And yeah, Brent, I think, I, excuse me, I think uh, they wouldn't be put in the Cobra Club so you're get the flying elbow or a figure four. That's right. You know, <laughs> what, what might happen. And let, let me ask you about, so one of the, you know, some of the, the top finishers that you do, how do you come up with, the, what was it Vince, or do you do you come up with your own, like, hey, this is going to be my finishing move, a flying elbow, or how did, you know, how did that get into your No, uh, uh, your game? pretty much the rest of us would come up with, with our own stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I, I used to do the flying body press, you know, you hit the ropes mm -hmm. and you come up and just do the whole body, you catch them and think, right. you know, you, uh, knock them over. Mm -hmm. But then I don't know how I came up with 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 the flying elbow. Nobody else was doing it, and and I came up with it. And and since people have tried to do the what I the way I used to do it, and it, it often imitated, never duplicated. I guess. Yeah, I think uh, maybe Lex Luger tried because he had a bionic elbow, but uh, he he didn't sell it too well. So. So I know you wanted to work with Greg Valentine, one of the great technicians uh, that, that you liked working with, and Paul Orndorff also. Uh, how about tag team-wise? Because I know you got the Heart Foundation. It was uh, Demolition. Uh, any particular ones that, that you like to work with all the time, night in, day in and day out? I, I don't know if you remember the, the Islanders. Uh, oh, yes, of course, yeah. I mean, those guys were, I mean, they were awesome. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they were hard workers and, and oh, yeah. would get the fans to go crazy. Bret Hart and, and, and Jim the Anvil Neidhart. Jim the Anvil Neidhart didn't have a clue in the ring. You know, he was just a big strong oh, guy, but you know, he yeah. he didn't have he didn't have a clue. Uh, but you know, if I was to choose anybody the Islanders, you yeah. know there was a lot of great uh, baby face tag teams like Shawn Michaels and, and Marty Jannetty and you know oh, there was a lot of other guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as uh, the you know the heel teams uh, back then, you know, tech teams were big. You know, the, the people used oh, to yeah. love tech team matches. You know, oh yeah, everybody had great psychology. You know, how to work a tag. You know, now they don't. You know, psychology is gone as far as as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to ask you about. It. I've uh, I've been watching lately WWE and the the, uh, the new one now, the new uh, organization AEW. And I heard you in another interview talk about, uh, you know, ring psychology, how you would play off from the fans. Now, if you look at what's happening right now, it's just a bunch of uh, monitors. Right. Uh, you know, there's no fans. So how, how, uh, how, what would you do if you were wrestling now? How would you work that ring psych? How would you do with ring psychology now with, with no fans? How well, would that it's, be? You know, it's, it's to me, the psychology of professional wrestling, a baby phase. Mm hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, the stronger you get with, with your, with your experience, the more people respect you, the, your opponents. So they kind of let you control the match. But, you know, it's very, to me, it's very simple. I was a baby face. I was a wrestler. So the baby face out wrestles the heel. The heel has to cheat to stop you. Mm -hmm. And you got to cheat behind where the referee can't see you, then then they're steep, you know, then they're, then they're beating you down. And, and But while you're, you're getting beaten down, the baby face, you can't die. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta show life, you gotta show life. And then whenever, whenever the crowd starts chanting you, you know, then you start shaking your hand and uh, move, shaking your leg, shaking something and start to come up and then have the heel pull you down or pull your trunks. And then finally, when it's time to come home, the baby face makes a comeback, boom, boom, boom. And, you know, until, you, you, like, I used to have a lot of fire. So once I, you make a comeback, you make a comeback till the, till the end. 
you know, a lot of times you, 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 I would go over, I would beat the guy, or, uh, you know, there was a different, uh, a different ending, but you still, you know, whenever I got beat, the, the heel usually had to cheat. Uh, you know, I had him beat, he puts it, I catch him with a flying forearm, he takes a bump, he lays close to the rope, one, two, he puts his leg on the rope, he, that's, that's how he saves himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, psychology, you know, b- b- the baby face wrestles, the heel has to cheat. Right now in Hidalgo County, um, Tito, we are one of the, um, the coronavirus, like, hotspots. Um, and we are experiencing some, some uh, um, deaths, like, like every day. Um, and we have some teachers that watch, like, our show. And... They're experiencing something that I guess was a nightmare for some teachers to basically say that we're going to have to teach our kids through a computer screen and talk to a computer screen. Um, what are, are your thoughts or can you give like any tips or advice for other teachers that are, are telling themselves maybe I can't teach these kids right now through a computer screen? Well, it, it, like I said earlier, it, it's just very, very difficult to get the kids to even show up. I have a, my virtual class, I have 25 students, and uh, it's every Monday, and pretty much every Monday, there's only about 13 or 12 that show up. Uh, as far as the teaching goes, you're going to have this, the, the good student who's going to pay attention to your lesson and, 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 and is going to get as much as if you were teaching in person. And then you have the kids who, if they were in class, they wouldn't pay attention and they're not going to pay attention to you there. You know, and then they know all the tricks that they sign up uh, and then they leave and, and they leave a picture there. And they, you know, so I call their name and there's no answer. They think you can't figure it out. You know, they think we're stupid, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it, it's very difficult. You know, uh, we're, we're living through a difficult situation. I, I mean, I just don't, un, you know, we, in cla- the other four days I'm in school, I have to wear a mask. I mean, I, I just don't get how, how people go out in public, don't distance and don't wear a mask. You know, I, I, I don't want to get political, but... You know, it, it's for your safety and for other people's safety to wear the mask. You know, people are dying. You know, right. you can go, you can go into groups and and and, uh, and, and then go home and, and, and get sick and give it to your your grandma, your your grandpa, your your your, your mom. And you know, people got to do the right thing. You know, if 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 they don't listen to to, to the to the doctors, you know, uh, that that are telling us what to do. You know something's wrong. You know, and there, I remember watching uh, in Padre Island, all the people on the beach. You know, this summer, not wearing masks. You know, you're gonna get sick. You know, you're gonna spread it. You know, and because uh, you guys were behind us, we got we New York, New Jersey, we got it first, and then it worked its way to the rest of the country because it, it started in New York, mm-hmm. and then I mean. You guys weren't feeling it at first because uh, I, my best friend, is uh, still lives in Sherryland, right there, you know, right outside of Mission. And you know, I, I talk to him quite often, and you know, when it hit, it hit. He's got to be strong to it. Wear a mask. Tito Santana. Tito Santana. Wear, 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 wear a mask. Wear a mask. Wear masks. Right. <laughs> Keep a distance. Wear a mask. Keep a distance. You know, it's you know six feet. You know, not asking for much. Uh, I know, uh, did you try, you traveled a lot with, um, Andre the Giant on the road. I know you guys, you guys were close. Did you always let him win at cards? That's what I have to ask. <laughs> no, you know, uh, Andre was a very smart man and he was a good card player. We played, we either played, uh, gin rummy mm-hmm. or there was a game called cribbage. It was a board game and, and, uh, Andre was making so much money, you know. Uh, I played cards, and, and he'd be beating me, and I would always tell, I would, he'd call everybody boss. So I said, I would say, boss, 
no milk for the kids tonight. And he would say, oh, boss, don't say that. And then he, you know, then he, then I started winning. So I never knew if he worked it, he let me win or what, but, you know, he didn't want to take my money. Wow. Yeah, I've heard a lot of great stories about Andre, just, uh, just the car player that was, he always was. And of course, besides a great wrestler, and they just always said, yeah, you know, Andre always, Andre always had to play cards. That's what he was yeah. always doing. It was my job. If we were in the same card, he'd be waiting with the cars and with the table and waiting for me. Okay, boss. So I'd have to go get my stuff and, and get dressed as I was playing cards with him. Tito, you're you on. Ever, you, you know, I didn't even have time to warm up. You know, they'd call me that I was next and, you know, I, I'd be ready and I'd go. Did you ever, did you ever wrestle uh, Andre in any of those shows uh, on the road? Yes, I did. I, I wrestled him, and, and I wrestled as a partner. I was partners with him. Wow. Yeah, he was for a big man. He had great ring psychology. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Watching his matches, he was just yeah. always knew what he was doing. It was everything was technical and uh, right. Yeah. Tito, do you visit the uh, the Rio Grande Valley often or? Uh, not very often, uh, especially now since the pandemic. We we haven't gone anywhere. But uh, I, I probably, I was going to the Valley, I went like three summers in a row because I was hanging out with my brother and we'd go to Padre Island and my best friend. But, uh, you know, since the pandem pandemic came around, we, we didn't make it this summer. And uh, my wife wants to go to Europe uh, next summer and, you know, travel different, because I have a son that lives in Africa and right now he's in Ireland and he has friends in Ireland, so... She's talking Ireland and meeting my son there. Did any of your family members pursue um, wrestling? No, no. My my, uh, I had three boys. My my oldest son's a, a lawyer, uh, like yourself. Uh, he works for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Wow. Uh, he, he he wanted a an eight to five job. <laughs> 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 he loves what he does. Uh, my middle son graduated from Princeton, and, and he uh, he does human rights work. He, he lives in Africa, and my little the little guy uh, got a, a degree in finance and uh, in accounting, and uh, he works. What's the name of the company, Leah, that he works for? He's the vice president at Fexet. He's doing really good. So there, you know, I, I when they were little, I said. Uh, they love wrestling, and I said, "Do you guys want to be away from your kids as much as I'm away from you guys?" And I think it set in, you know. And, and they never, we never pushed them that way. My wife, you know, did a great job, and, and she she steered them towards the education. And they were very, they were all very smart. Doing, you did a fantastic job with your your three sons. That is in, incredible. I mean, to come from your migrant background and have sons that attend these Ivy League schools and now are professionals, that is outstanding. Yeah, we're really proud of them. And, you know, I, you know, I can't take the, the credit because it was my wife that was at home. I was in the road, you know. My wife is a very smart girl, too. So, uh, you know, I... I did what I could when I when I was home, but uh, it was a it was not an easy life. What are your uh, your future plans, Tito? Well, i I'd like to I'd like to be able to teach two more years and retire, and <laughs> you know, then do what I want to do, whatever I want to do, and you know, uh, I like I enjoy walking with my wife. There, there's a, a a park that we go and we walk you know, for an hour. I have a gym in my house. I, I, I enjoy lifting. You know, I, I lift real light now, but uh, I enjoy staying, staying in shape. And, you know, we, we, I'd like to travel. We, we'd like to travel. Tito, going back to uh, 04, the Hall of Fame night, I was looking, of course. <laughs> uh, I was going back to, to the lineup in 04 and reading it. That's a big John Stud. Greg the Hammer Valentine, Harley Race, Jesse the Body, Junkyard Dog, Sergeant Sauter, Superstar Billy Graham, Bobby the Brain, and uh, uh, Don Morocco. Being in that class, 
Uh, I couldn't think of a better lineup. How how was that? How was that night? How was that weekend? How was that week? And you know, back in '04 with with everybody there. Well, it was it was a fantastic uh, night. Uh, you know, when I, I was in the first class, uh, mm-hmm. the first big class. They, they had had right. a, a Hall of Fame earlier, a couple of years earlier in in Baltimore. Uh, they inducted a few guys, but it was a, you know, it, it was in a, in a hotel in, in, in a restaurant. Right. Uh, and when they invited me to, when they called me up and, and told me that I was going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, I, excuse me, I, uh, the only thing that I cared about was how much was I going to get paid. You know, I, I had left. You know, uh, there was a little bit of bit bitterness. You know, when, when I left. You know, because I, I felt that. They didn't treat me as well as they could have treated me. So there was a little bit of bitterness there. So I asked how much, when they told me how much they were going to give me, I, you know, I said, oh, okay. And then the way, uh, I mean, Vince McMahon flew my, fa- my my whole family, you know, my brother, my sister, my mom. My, uh, uh, I think there was about five or six of them that they flew. Uh, they got us hotels downtown in New York. They, they sent two limos to my house, two stretches to pick pick us all up, and mm-hmm. first class operation. And then we get there. Uh, I didn't realize when I, as soon as we get, I didn't realize because I I stopped going to the wrestling matches. As soon as we got to the hotel, and I saw people from all over the world, you know, coming out and and, and uh, rushing my limo like like I, I felt like I was a big star, you know, and and. Uh, it was a good feeling, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, it was the first time that I had seen just how big it had grown, and and, and it was a great weekend. And I mean, there was a lot of talent there, you know. John Kerr Dog was gone. Uh, I, I don't know if John Stott was had passed already by then. Also, I, I think he did. Yeah, Big John Stott, yes, sir. I think he did. Yeah. So I mean, but it was a lot of talent there. Tito, thank you, Tito. That's thank, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and. Um, sharing your story with our listeners and uh, me and Marco uh, have been trying really hard to keep our composure through this interview. <laughs> yes. I have so You've many more job. questions. You've done a great job. So, this is my first interview. This is that show. And he invited me on cause I'm a big wrestling fan. I like to show the whole room if I could, but I can't, but yeah, I was, was nervous. It was, I, I just had a great time. It's my first time interviewing a celebrity and it, it was just awesome. Thank you, Tito. 